a lot of people get confused, especially when you have against KubeCon is also KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con. And I'm like, wait, what's the difference here? The two are closely tenanted and intermingled for sure. Cloud Native didn't really exist until Kubernetes came along. When you're developing an app, security might be treated as an afterthought. With functionality requirements and tight deadlines, it's easy to accidentally write vulnerable code or use a vulnerable dependency. But Sneak can help you secure your code in real time, so you don't need to slow down to build securely. Develop fast, stay secure. Good developer. Sneak. Kubernetes security has been really popular. Like, it's like everywhere. But one thing that we don't talk about is Kubernetes, serverless. Why is it that people are more leaning towards Kubernetes versus serverless? It doesn't explain why there's a conference called KubeCon and Cloud Native Con together. Why is Cloud Native Security and Kubernetes Security spoken about as two different things? We basically spoke a lot about all of this and how difficult is it to do security? What are some of the common vectors of Kubernetes in general when you look at deploying them in managed communities or unmanaged communities? For this conversation, we had Andrew Martin from Control Plane. He came and spoke about his book, which is Hacking Kubernetes. And he spoke about some of the attack vectors. Where should you really consider using Kubernetes and where should not use Kubernetes? We also spoke about why is there popular Kubernetes security controls that you could be using and deploying on your applications so you can actually prevent something wrong from going on. So if you are someone who's trying to learn about Kubernetes security and maybe some of the attack vectors that go with Kubernetes security as well, definitely check out this episode. And if you're listening or watching this for the second or third time, we are available on your socials like the Apple podcast, so Spotify podcast, LinkedIn, YouTube for videos as well. Definitely give us a follow and subscribe. Also leave us a review and rating on iTunes and Spotify because it definitely helps us find more amazing guests like Andrew Martin who are book authors sharing the knowledge free as well to for everyone to learn from. Also, just an FYI, we are also media partners for the KubeCon EU. So you would definitely see us over there. You probably would see LinkedIn posts or Twitter posts from the Cloud Security Podcast team for when we're there. If you're there and you see us, definitely give us a hello. And I would love to take pictures with you. We're also attending RSA, which is the largest cybersecurity conference happens in San Francisco. And if you're there, again, I would love for you to come and say hello and take pictures with me because I run this thing called the RSA Fashion Week. And last year, it was an amazing experience to show the other side of cybersecurity beyond just us talking about technical things and abbreviation. So I look forward to saying hello to everyone who's going to be attending the conferences. And for everyone else, enjoy the episode and definitely look out for the episodes where we cover our highlights from those conferences as well. All right, enjoy the episode. Andrew, for the first few people probably don't know who you are. How would you describe yourself and what are you up to these days, man? Hello. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I am CEO and founder at Control Plane. My background is in everything from development through operations and security, of course. And we focus on cloud native security. That is unlocking cloud and cloud customized developments and deployments like containers, Kubernetes and custom runtimes for regulated industries, difficult problems. And we love security, CTFs, running training sessions, auditing and building, and all that good stuff. I think that's kind of where I first met you when you were running a CTF on one of those cloud native security conferences as well. And maybe the right person to ask about this as well, because you hear the word, you use cloud native security. How would you describe cloud native security? Because a lot of people would, depending on who you talk to, they just kind of relate more to the CSP side. But how do you describe cloud native security when someone asks you? There's a really useful compound view of this from the Kubernetes docs themselves. It, the four C's from code, container, cluster, and cloud. Yeah. And so cloud native security is the holistic overview of all of those things. We assume that the application running in the container at some point will become insecure, be that through an existing zero day or something developing in the future. It's very rare that something that runs for months or years maintains its baseline level of security. So outside of that, the configuration of the container that holds the code is really important. That is the runtime invocation of the process. Those are things like dropping capabilities, not running as roots, applying setcomp or Linux security modules to tighten down the set of privileges that that application has. Outside of that, once we can be reasonably safe in the knowledge that if somebody gets remote code execution into the container, they still have a very limited amount of functionality available to them, only what's required for the application to run, then if that attacker can't break out of the container, let's say, which is difficult in itself, they will look at the orchestrator. 
They will mm. look at the, the cluster orchestrator to try and figure out how to pivot. Maybe the visible horizon also includes data stores or queues or other VMs that are sat on the network and addressable via the network from that pod. So at that point, it's about the network policy. It's about admission control to make sure that things come into the cluster with correct configuration. It's about running intrusion detection because anomalous behavior it's reasonably easy to identify, but that there are sort of subversive and quiet methods of emulating application traffic in order to do discovery. And finally, at that point, the largest reason for cloud compromise is misconfiguration. So looking at the entire cloud account. So while cloud native really focuses in on the container as the atomic unit of compute, it still sits in a topology, it sits in a cloud or in a co-located data center. And in order for something to be secure, our approach is to threat model the whole thing. So cloud native security is the same as cloud security. It's the same as to some extent application security, but we have a declarative interface by which we can configure these things. And that leads itself to testability. So we then have all that good stuff, static analysis and dynamic testing and pipelines, and hopefully full reproducibility of the behavior of the workload. So cloud security, cloud native security and security are just moments on the same sort of spectral paradigm <laughs> of security. And I'm, I'm glad it's coming from you as well, because a lot of people ask me, why do I talk about cloud native security on cloud security podcasts? I've kind of answered my question for them as well. I want to clip this up and just you know, use that as a, this is why I talk about <laughs> cloud native security on cloud security podcasts as well. And uh, just an extension of that same thing as well, because you mentioned the four C's, cluster being the one that I probably relate to with the Kubernetes context. How do you describe Kubernetes security as well then? Is that, how different is that? Well, I deeply appreciate all the effort that maintainers and contributors have put into building out Kubernetes. And when I wrote the book, Hacking Kubernetes with my esteemed co-author, Mr. Michael Hassenblas, one of the first things that we start off by saying is huge thanks, kudos and respect to everybody mm -hmm. who's given us the opportunity to examine this thing in the first place. Kubernetes from its genesis was built for developers. It was built in order to win developer mindshare, to rapidly accelerate the growth of containers and orchestration. And it gave us these primitives that a single container could not, which mm. included things like service discovery, multi-host networking, centralized control plane, if you like, with, with the high availability API server, API extensions like the CRDs that were introduced. These things were very developer and operator focused, and rightly so, because Kubernetes then steamrolled all the competition and snowballed into the second biggest open source project on GitHub. But these things came at some cost of security because we don't have default network policies. We can still address everything on the network from a pod. The pod security policy and pod security is now was not turned on by default. And it makes some sense if we're developer focused to not constrict behavior because it's less confusing for a developer, but it doesn't play to the secure by default, secure by design mentality. Now, a huge amount of work has gone in to fixing this. One of the things that sort of still exists as a primary or a fundamental primitive is nodes are not namespaced. Nodes can take any workload. And that's because of the fundamental dissonance between bin packing and maximizing the compute and the resource usage of a cluster to save money for an operator versus isolating workloads. Now, there are other mechanisms. We can apply node pools. We can tag things and delineate them via admission control and, and scheduling. But Again, it's not quite the same. So when it comes to securing Kubernetes itself, it's first of all about considering, do we run one cluster or many clusters? What level of multi-tenancy do we think is safe? And the hard multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is difficult. There are things again, by default that are developer facing, like injecting all the environment variables for service discovery into a container. That is an immediate sort of intelligence gift to an attacker that you can suddenly see where everything is. DNS has been historically easy to enumerate from that perspective as well. So Kubernetes security sits in a kind of transcendent view between ensuring that the development team are able to do what they need to do in a timely and unhindered manner on that spectrum, again, to the security and observability teams who will kind of tighten knobs and dials or just purely delineate the topology of, of how multiple clusters are deployed based upon classification of data and sensitivity, environment type. For example, we wouldn't want production and dev on the same cluster for anything sensitive or serious. And then cost, of course, because if we're a startup and we're doing something heavy AI ML, perhaps, we probably don't want to get too many GPUs attached to things. And we're probably more likely to multi-tenant. Yes. So as with everything, Teflon shouldered answer, everything is a compromise and it's based on usage. So 
maybe to your point then, because you're also the co-chair for CNCS Technical Advisory Group as well for security. I'm just curious, what is the difference? Because you kind of mentioned cloud native security is a four Cs, clusters, containers, cloud, and all of that. And then we're talking about Kubernetes security, but a lot of people get confused, especially when you have, I guess, KubeCon is also KubeCon plus cloud native con. And like, wait, what's the difference here? Like, I think, aren't we, like, I think A, also because maybe Kubernetes is popular. A, why is it popular? And if it, why, what's the difference between the straight up security and cloud native security? The two are closely tenanted and intermingled for sure. Cloud native didn't really exist until Kubernetes came along. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation was birthed under the Linux Foundation to provide a home for the IP for Kubernetes because Ooh. Google built this thing and they realized that if, if you love something, let it go. In order <laughs> to ensure an open governance model, they needed an independent foundation to prove to the world that they were serious about the success of this technology and they were not going to gatekeep. They were not going to apply the veneer of private interest to something that ultimately could be a public good, which I, I mean, it, it's proven itself to be. Yep. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation wrapped Kubernetes initially and then brought on in other initial projects like Prometheus and Container D and, and Run C and, and eventually F Cryo, all, all the runtimes, so many of the supporting applications that run on top. So in terms of what is Kubernetes security and what is cloud native, broadly they sit in the same sphere. However, because of the proliferation of Kubernetes, because of its place in critical infrastructure at this point, it runs on some US jets. It runs on, on various edge places. I've got a feeling that it ended up in space at one point. And, and yeah, I heard that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a submarine, meat factories, like think of like the most obscure places. And like, what? They use Kubernetes? Like, but Lift a rock. Like, oh. Yeah. But to, to your point, then if Kubernetes came before the cloud native, why was there... And I know we're going into a bit of a history lesson here, but I'm just curious, what makes it so popular? Like, I think, I'm sure there's cloud native capability in the cloud itself. Now, cloud service providers, like AWS has a version, Azure has a version, GCP has a version, do what you call out as well. Why so popular? Because I think I spoke to a few people, they all said they, the one newer resolution that a lot of people had for learning something new was Kubernetes for 2023. And I'm going, wow, clearly there hasn't been enough of it. I've already had two months of this <laughs> last year. I'm going, holy shit, I have to have another month? So like, wh why is it so popular, man? There was a dream when Terraform was released in... Oof. 2015, I'm going to guess, 14, 15, yeah, yeah, that, that it would be cross-cloud. It would enable hybrid cloud infrastructure. Now, hybrid cloud, by definition, is extremely difficult to achieve. Bursting a workload into a cloud makes sense because clouds yeah. are, by virtue, elastic. Yeah. But running high available master data stores across a distance comes with latency. That comes with yeah. conflict. There are useful data types like T's, conflict resolution conflict resolving data types something like this that kind of encapsulate the data and this is how google docs works for example yeah if people make offline edits then the whole thing will deterministically merge down but these things are really difficult and running a database across multiple clouds is very tricky so hybrid infrastructure in itself is a questionable thing some regulations for, for banks for example require multiple cloud availability but it's not necessarily cross cloud it's re-implementations of a stovepipe in those clouds yeah so we go from terraform and everyone's still sort of holding this dream of right once deploy everywhere i suppose <laughs> into containers and then containers turn up and, and they promise this ubiquity of runtime we can package and build on, on my local machine. There are some, it should run everywhere uniformly. Of course, if your kernel version is different, you're using different APIs. If your configuration that's injected, environment variables or config maps different, then you'll follow different code paths in the application. But broadly, this container should run everywhere. At that mm. point, people start to think, okay, well, how do I take this atomic unit of a container and run it on AWS and GCP and Azure? And the answer for a long time was, well, you stand up a Google Kubernetes engine, a GKE cluster, and you run it there. Or you go into Amazon and you run COPS, like K-O-P-S, which was uh, the, the original distribution, because Amazon used to have the ECS, the Elastic Container Service, as their only yeah. container offering for many moons. So yeah. EKS didn't turn up for a good couple of years. And AKS, I think, then turned up kind of contemporaneously-ish with that yeah. as well. So the reason that it's so popular is Firstly, it provides a uniform abstraction above the hardware and to some extent above the cloud. But in the same way that Terraform is supposed to be uniform across clouds, there are specificities 
especially when it comes down to the way that, for example, the network is constructed. There are three very different network technologies in AWS, GCP, and Azure. Yeah. Mixing pure TCP IP, encapsulation, BGP, that there's other various sort of magical tunnels that the Azure has as well that you can use. So fundamentally, the building blocks upon which the infrastructure is built differs. And while the runtime of Kubernetes is broadly the same, admission control, service identity, and workload interaction with cloud itself all differ. So while Kubernetes is a platform platform designed for building a top, there are still differences in the clouds that kind of muddy those waters. Ultimately, really, developers are the new kingmakers. And yep. the reason Kubernetes really is so popular is because somebody can learn the skills to administer a Kubernetes deployment at one organization, change jobs and come with the requisite skills. You don't any longer have to learn why are we deploying like this? What's my custom packaging? How are we spinning VMs up and down with our base images? You just deploy onto a common sea of orchestration. And so, so really, I think giving that uniformity of job opportunity to operators and developers is almost more important than the uniform cloud deployment. Oh, because it's the same skill set across the board, irrespective of where you go. It's the same cube. I mean, a cube, <laughs> a cube cuddle you're talking to. You're not really talking to like a new cube cuddle, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, exactly. Ah, okay. That's interesting, man. So, because so, you know how, I think one of the initial thoughts for this episode was also around the fact of the whole continuous security aspect of Kubernetes as well. For people who probably are listening to this for the first time and are already, like some of them had resolutions for learning Kubernetes in 2023. How would you describe the components of Kubernetes security? Are they different to regular security? Because you just called out, there's different kind of tunnel and CSPs that people look at all kinds of regions and I don't know what else you can totally go down the path of. But in the Kubernetes context, you have this, well, for people call it a data center within a data center as well sometimes. What are some of the components for Kubernetes security? And then maybe you can then start just transitioning into the whole continuous security side. What are some of the components for Kubernetes security for someone who's basically has never done security on Kubernetes before? The way that we deconstruct security in the book is starting with the pod concept. So a, a pod is one or more containers. The container is the bundled application and dependencies. And there's two parts to a container. There's the container image, which is yeah. the file system, just bundled up into a tarball. And then there's the container at runtime, which is that image untarred onto a machine. The primary process started and the security controls and namespacing and accounting created around that. So the first thing for somebody who, who wants to learn about Kubernetes security to look at is Linux security, because a container is just a microcosm of Linux. And this is really one of my favorite things about Kubernetes, because it was built by a team of such experience and understanding, they didn't try and reinvent the wheel. So when we talk about Kubernetes security, the initial security context for a pod is just Linux kernel security APIs. So we're talking about no new privileges, for example. That's a flag that you can turn on. That's supported directly by the kernel. You can turn that on in system D. You can enable it for any binary or process that it's running on your, on your server. So fundamentally, there's this, this wonderful intersection of if you start to peel back the layers, well, then there's a huge amount of corpus of existing information. You can go and read kernel code to figure out, oh, OK, well, that's actually just directly a flag that you can apply to the process. So first of all, there's that kernel deep dive you can do around the security context itself. Beyond that, again, sort of expanding out to understand the layers, Kubernetes cluster security comes down to a lot of Kubernetes networking is just IP tables, mm -hmm. and it's the same for container networking in general. So what we're talking about there is just taking the IP concept, which used to be the anchorage for firewalling, so you actually link identity to an IP address yep. because things would never change. And we'd have WANs going between data centers and you'd know that someone coming in on there is going to, you can firewall that IP address and then you expect them to do a, a certificate exchange and off you go. In containers, because things churn so quickly and based upon the same elastic compute concepts that AWS popularized, which are scale something out, expect things to fail and recover quickly, because then you, you build elasticity and resilience into your distributed system. Those concepts still apply to Kubernetes. And so when those IP addresses change so frequently, the IP tables rules that root packets have to change some frequency. What has happened from 
that very reasonably simple routing is that we now have a proliferation of container network interface plugins. They all use a slightly different technology. Some similar to, as you mentioned, the, the, all the different clouds, networking stacks being difficult to understand or learn sometimes. We have, again, sort of encapsulation, BGP, raw packet networking, different types of VPN tunneling, symmetric encryption, even service meshes, which kind of overlay on an over software defined overlay network to give you a layer seven, as, as well as the kind of layer four and five uh, encryption. The point of me sort of enumerating all of those complexities is to learn one of these things, because everything is based upon existing technologies, it makes sense to anchor your learning path on the technologies you already know. So mm. if somebody wants to build a cluster from scratch and do Kubernetes the hard way and has traditional BGP routing experience, well, Calico operates on a BGP in two, two modes, but one of them is BGP based yep. and debugging those things, intentionally breaking them to see where the rough edges are and how your alerting responds, for example, it is far easier when taking a technology that you know and, and finding the, the relevant paradigm in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Yes, really the landscape of Kubernetes is so wide because it's a generalized tool. It started off reasonably specialized in terms of, well, let's try and run web application workloads. And then immediately people said, well, let's do ETL. Let's try and run telephony. Let's build this multi-region. And so it, it's just about zeroing in with a laser focus on the applicability of the sort of pegs that one can hang their understanding on and then yeah. finding the way to apply that to Kubernetes and then, and then just persevering with the complexity of the distributed system. Interesting. So to extending that to continuous security then, where there's the whole ISC and CICD pipeline and all of that kind of going into it as well. How would you describe components for continuous security in Kubernetes landscape? Yes. So the elements of continuous security comes back to this assumption that we make a control plane that the application is or will be compromised. And so first of all, we expect that there is a solid AppSec pipeline behind any deployments. So we know the shift left mentality for application delivery. We're talking about IDs that hint for security errors. We're talking about direct syntax tree decomposition. So maybe there's a SQL injection here, maybe there's an XSS here, but those things actually, we assume at some point there'll be a compromise. So continuous Kubernetes security, it's about applying the runtime controls that the cluster is subjected to back into the pipeline, mm -hmm. even on the developer's machine, if, if they can. It's that same shift left mentality that we've taken for applications. And we're now applying to the transcendent boundary between development and operations. So it's say DevOps, but it's kind of in that space. So we have static analysis for infrastructure when we deploy Terraform or any of the other applications that use those providers. We have a statically generated manifest that the plan, the differential between current and the expected state. And we can then statically analyze that and say, oh, this will open a security group to the world. We're going to block this. We can't deploy this. So we have that for infrastructure. For applications, we have some of that for the abstract syntax tree and the vulnerability and the supply chain scanning for dependencies. For Kubernetes, it's between the two. It's the configuration of the application at runtime on the orchestrator. So we're talking static analysis again for the pod security content control plane built a tool called KubeSec about five years ago that, that does this. There's now so many tools that do this. Your cluster can be scanned at runtime or admission control time, but you can use exactly that same container that does a, the validation of the security context and just give it to the developer, put it into the CI CD workflow. What this does is it breaks down the barrier between security and the operation and development teams, because there's no longer somebody in an ivory tower saying, this didn't pass an unknown <laughs> scan that I will not give you access to. But instead it says, here we go. We're enabling you to, we trust our static analysis. We trust our policies and controls. And we're enabling you to perform debugging in an environment that you have full access to, which really is the problem with latter stage security gates. If yep. I try and deploy something and it escalates through dev UAT towards production, maybe it's in pre-prod or staging and it's blocked by security control. If as a developer, I can't get into that system, there are, for whatever reason, I don't have the right level of access that constricts me, that prevents me from doing my job ultimately. And that encourages intelligent developers to work around security controls and policies. So this whole shift left mentality applied to everything, including the static analysis of 
the declarative configurations that Kubernetes thrives on, because it is an eventually consistent distributed system. We, uh, as Tabitha Sable said once, we tell the Kubernetes robots our hopes and dreams and pray that it enacts them for us. <laughs> and we see this sometimes when you apply mm -hmm. something and you just wait for the, the API server, mm -hmm. right, CDs under load, and you wait for it to actually resolve. So yes, to draw all those bits back together, the orchestrator at large for continuous security, pushing all of those declarative configuration parts through a pipeline that runs the same admission control as the final container on the production cluster gives you this, this continuous security. And then if we change any of the policy, one of my colleagues, Chris Nesbitt-Smith has a talk he's doing at the moment called policy as versioned code. And the goal here is that if we have open policy agent or Caverno or something like this, and we want to introduce a new policy and we version that policy, we apply the new policy in tandem with the old policy and we annotate the resources that are being applied to the cluster to say they're compliant with this policy. If they're not, we get a notification. So instead of a very hard stop where there is no facility to, or there is no window of opportunity to upgrade our configuration to match policy, really the, the final icing on the cherry on the cake for continuous security is to version the policy as we change it, expose that to the developer as far left in the pipeline as possible and give them a reasonable window of time to react to that policy and ensure that they're compliant. And then we achieve the ultimate goal of consistent uptime and ultimately generating business value so that we all get paid and so we can feed our families or our cake addiction, whatever it might be. <laughs> or our dogs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess to add, because you know, you literally wrote the book on hacking Kubernetes. What are some of the common entry points or attack vectors that you come across quite often? And have they evolved since the beginning? Because you've been in the space for a long time as well. Have they changed much? Oh, I guess maybe let's start with what are they commonly? The most common cause of cloud compromise is misconfiguration. So anything that allows access to the cluster it is generally a, a bad day for somebody. The API server should never be on the public internet. There is no need for that to happen. There have been API server bypasses before of, of varying complexity and uh, sort of damage impact potential. Unless there is a very good specific reason, API servers should be privately addressable via a bastion or in via a VPN. Secondarily, we should never leak version information. The banner information that we can get from the slash version restful endpoint on the API server leaks, well, I mean, intentionally reveals the version of the API server that's running. We've learned to turn off banners on web servers, Nginx, Apache. Yeah. We don't do this by default, but it's again, just part of the paradigm shift. So once we're sure that the API server is not accessible, that closes off a whole direct impact point. Notably, Shodan and various other enumerating and port scanning services will still list a huge number of clusters that exist on the public internet with very old versions. So don't be one of those clusters is probably the primary recommendation. At that point, how does an attacker get into a cluster? It Again, it falls back to commonly used attack patterns. One of those applications on the cluster is probably web facing. So that means that an attacker or a legitimate user can start with a DNS name, a host name, or an IP address and get their packet routed through the edge via multiple hops to a, a socket running in that container. So there's Nginx running in a container, maybe proxying to a web app, or it's a Golang app that has its own HTTP server. That then becomes the public point of risk and, and potential compromise. Anything that can generate remote code execution in that context is then the first foothold for an attacker. And um, we're talking things like log for shell, for example, if we have a, a JVM app running that faces the web and somebody can inject arbitrary code that fires off this reverse shell back to an attacker controlled endpoint to establish command and control in the container. At that point, we're then, this is the expectation of how we model systems. At that point, there's the expectation that the network is at risk. And so the reality afforded to the attacker should be that same minimal set of privileges afforded to the application itself. Of course, those are very traditional I say traditional, but that's hacking in a nutshell, if you like. Yeah. What we see increasingly these days is a proliferation of supply chain attacks. So we're not going in via the front door. We're coming in via the development process, via a trusted ingestion process. This really blew up with SolarWinds. There have been US and various other governmental responses to this, requiring SBOMs, et cetera. This doesn't really fix the nature of the problem for open source software. An S-bomb doesn't get us anywhere that vulnerability and dependency scanning can't do already. 
For yeah. closed source software, it's a very different proposition because we have no introspection or insight into the composition of those artifacts. And we have something called VEX coming out as well, the vulnerability exploitability exchange format, where vendors can indicate that even though they're using log4j somewhere, its particular method signature is not reachable. So they're using a vulnerable version, but it's not reachable. And they can distribute that along with their closed source software to indicate it is safe to run this, even though, as we've told you, there's something vulnerable. These things come down to a huge question of trust. And really the level of trust is as an enterprise, do I trust this vendor enough to run their application? And from there, do we trust if they provide a true SBOM and a true VEX? The point being is that for a compromised open source package, the SBOM may not represent anything like what is inside it. And so we still need to trust our software composition scanning tools. The reason for this being is that the attack there might be something like I installed an open source package to my local machine as a developer. And if it's a, a Node.js package, an NPM package, for example, I can run a pre-commit hook. That pre-commit hook can contain, for example, key loggers, data stealers, something that would go into my home directory and tarball up my SSH keys, my GPG keys. They should both be password protected. GPG key should be on a hardware or a new key, hopefully. But if I've just authenticated via OAuth into something, there are session tokens that may have one to 24 hours expiration. There's also probably a cube config there. So a supply chain attack against the developer who can then, which either gifts cluster access, again, it, if that cluster is publicly routable, then you're straight in with whatever level of credentials are provided there. Or maybe a more nefarious and insidious assault where the commit keys are used to then inject a theoretically benevolent code from a trusted committer or committer just by virtue, again, of the supply chain foothold. It can also be dropping an Easter egg or an implant in that doesn't trigger until some certain set of conditions, which is a little bit more like the, the SolarWinds attack. So yes, the <laughs> API server, public Sounds facing scary. WebSocket, and the whole supply chain. Wow. What's left then? That's like, isn't that the entire thing? <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, well, switch off your computer and walk away at that point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Moonwalk so, back so slowly. Yeah, so because we kind of touched on the whole cluster API thing as well. And just to kind of reel that back in for people who are probably getting into the space and going, Jesus, that sounds like the entire pipeline is at risk. You also mentioned that, you know, it it's something which is managed, unmanaged, which is a cloud version and non-cloud version. How different are these attack vectors compared to, say, someone might be using an AWS version or Azure or AKS or EKS or whatever acronym you're going to go for? Is that the same threats are applicable or are they lot less because cloud has taken some more of them away. Yeah, this is the key question for deployments, isn't it? We have a shared responsibility model with a cloud provider, Yeah, which says for a managed platform, the CSP will take some of the risk. They will, for example, manage the patch hygiene of the base operating system. They will manage the network security for traffic routed in, as in it will be encrypted up to the point that it lands in the cluster. And that shared responsibility model is incredibly useful because it means that we can rely upon data access patterns and data center management that we don't have to deal with ourselves. The physical compromise of these devices, of course, is game over in many cases. Yeah. Very interesting stuff happening with confidential computing and containers that will help to protect against malevolent root users or hardware compromise. But I digress. The goal there of that shared responsibility is to offload as much risk as possible from the user onto the cloud provider. And as we know from, again, the supply chain question from Log4Shell, generally the greatest risk is misconfiguration because mm -hmm. of all the other risk is transferred. But coming up quite close behind that is the, the use of old, unpatched and outdated software. So when we deploy a cluster and it sits outside of the maintenance window, that then falls out of support from the cloud provider and there's an intrinsic incentive there to make sure that that's updated. In the same way, the base operating system will continue to receive security patches. We have things like Google's COS and Bottle Rocket in AWS and Flatcar in Azure, which are all broadly based upon the old Core OS model, yep. which is built from Gentoo and then sort of Chrome OS, bizarrely, and then Core OS is, is what came afterwards. And that's an immutable base operating system upon which a package manager has no ability to write and then running custom or additional software as a container. 
which is incredibly powerful because it means you can mark all of your mount points as non-exec, read-only, and as an attacker, it makes it a lot more difficult to run default scripts to drop implants. Now, there's always somewhere to run something. It's, it's a whole new paradigm that makes it more difficult. So it is definitely better to use the hardened cloud provider managed services. They go a huge way to ensuring those run by default more securely. Compare and contrast to running Kubernetes natively on, on a custom set of VMs, you do get some more control. Yeah. It's a powerful thing. And for a lot of the time, probably not necessary. There is also the opportunity to find economies of scale with sort of home rolled super high throughput clusters than there is on, on the managed. But in general, we would always recommend people go for managed services unless they have a, a data center based requirement. Right. So just kind of like what general recommendation in general, well, in general recommendation in general is also as well. The, the other question that I also have, because we spoke about kind of like the entry points, the attack vectors, we also spoke about what are some of the advantages of going for a managed service on uh, instead of going for an unmanaged service. Are there controls also practical? Because I, I imagine... If someone just goes to a Kubernetes documentation, just looking at standard Kubernetes way of solving or having security controls in there, how different would that be from a, I guess, a managed Kubernetes perspective? And what are some of the examples that you can suggest people can actually, maybe once they listen to the episode, they can go and look whether they're actually doing that or not. I think in terms of the security of a cluster, the sort of minimum viable cloud native security is scanning for vulnerable dependencies, because mm -hmm. ultimately we can layer these controls, but we don't want an attacker to get into our application in the first place. Beyond that, it's the admission control configuration. And some of the admission controls that are offered by the clouds, super nifty. One that I really love is Google's binary authorization, which allows us to sign containers and say, this container is authorized for usage based on these signatures from these maintainers, and it will only be admitted under those terms. Building out that policy of admission control it is really the delineating factor for a secure cluster deployment. And the nuance there, again, we have OPA, Open Policy Agent, we have Gatekeeper to support that as well, which is super nice because Open Policy Agent can apply policy uniformly across multiple different domains. It can be used in process for an application, for a distributed system, for admission into Netas itself. Then we've got something like Caverno, mm -hmm. which is scoped very specifically into a admission control into a cluster. So yeah, really it's about tuning those things. The managed services offer some extra sort of bits and bobs around those, but those are uniformly deployable across managed or unmanaged services. And the final point always is the last line of defense has to be intrusion detection because humans are fallible. We can't be sure that what's secure today will be secure tomorrow. And the last line of defense really has to be alerting an observation for those things. I love to talk about canary tokens as well. Dropping essentially tripwires across the infrastructure is a really helpful way of, even if intrusion detection is bypassed or turned off somehow, leaving nuggets of digital hand grenades spread across <laughs> the infrastructure. I love that description of canary tokens. I probably should use that for instead of calling it honeypots. I should probably just go for that. Hand grenades just dropped around. <laughs> with the thing pulled out. That's pretty awesome. So wait, I think maybe extending that a bit more from a Kubernetes perspective, as people deploy and uh, some of the common usage patterns people come across with, I think so there are restrictions in managed Kubernetes where some of them only allow for one cluster at a time, but then people say you should go multi-cluster. What's the recommendation here in terms of what's the reason for people to go multi-cluster? Multi-cluster in terms of running different applications on different clusters is a question of drawing the security boundary, really. So multi-tenanting multiple applications on the same cluster suggests that perhaps we, if one of those applications is compromised, the data classification of the others is within our same level of risk management. Yeah, yeah. So if we're happy for the full takeover of a cluster to reveal secrets across the whole board, then a single cluster is fine. When it comes to delineating customer data, for example, then that might not be acceptable. And this is a fine balance that has to be risk managed. And this is where we would threat model everything yeah. in order to quantify the decision and leave a paper trail for auditors or people in the future. So multi-cluster generally is when we don't trust that the controls that we have are suitable. So a good example would be the speculative execution vulnerabilities of the last few years. If I was running my financial services application with PII for multiple different financial service customers on the same cluster, 
and the speculative execution vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown come out and suddenly an attacker from within a container can start reading data for other customers. Well, that is beyond my level of risk tolerance. That is an existential threat for my theoretical organization. And so I can't allow that to happen. So what I would do there is do physical hardware separation of the clusters in order to ensure that in the event of compromise, the data leak is restricted to that cluster. Mm. When there are multiple clusters, it's the delineation between the operational complexity of a user running multiple clusters, having to manage multiple dashboards, access, remediations, which requires more human complexity versus easier runtime maintenance and and deployment of a single larger cluster, but balanced against the security risks. And Mm. as always, go back to the sliding spectrum, everything is a compromise and there is no one true way. I agree. I think, and to add to this complexity as well within the whole multi-cluster, single cluster, it's also, I guess, how much flexibility do you get from a cloud service provider as well? Because just because you read documentation or Kubernetes can work a certain way, that option may not be available for you in a cloud service provider as well. So there is that complexity added as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's like yeah. going for an Android versus an iPhone, I guess. You probably never get access to the iPhone OS. <laughs> so it's probably going to start a few wars over there, but I'm going to hold myself <laughs> over there. <laughs> but to add another layer to all this as well is the added complexity for... A lot of people would ask, at the end of the day, you call it dependency as well for application. There's a dependency for containers being used for the community support as well. Should everyone go for Kubernetes? I, I get it. It's really popular, but is it for everyone? Like, I think it feels like, you know, when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. It's a conversation where if I know Kubernetes and it's good for my job flexibility, I'm just going to say, you should Kubernetes that. I don't know why you're not doing that. So is there an element where, honestly, people should just not put Kubernetes? If Are there other use cases for that? Absolutely. The birth of next generation runtimes has accelerated this as well. So I adore Google Cloud Run, for example. Google Cloud Run takes a single container. It runs it in a Knative-like functions as service harness that's actually, it's Knative compatible running on a kind wow. of App Engine Borg style cell. Um, but you can also run Knative on Istio on plain Kubernetes. There's also things like Fargate, mm-hmm. which are yeah. great ways to orchestrate that Fargate under the hood firecracker which is yep. a micro VM that combines containerization around a virtual machine manager with a super, super trimmed down QMU implementation, basically just boots with like an escape key instead of a full keyboard or control up delete. I think those kind of very minimal attack surfaces at, at, and startup times. So for any given application, considering its runtime behavior and patterns and scalability requirements and ease of developer access are really paramount because no one got fired for buying IBM. <laughs> no one's been fired for running Kubernetes in the past few years. And that Gartner quadrant keeps on pushing it. But really, there are multiple ways to run containers. Looking at things coming up, like, again, the confidential computing, confidential containers pieces, they can run in Kubernetes. They can also run just on metal around a VM with containers inside. Obviously, that's for a secure computing use case. Yeah. But probably the other end of that discussion is that is really accelerated toward the edge. And instead of sort of heterogeneous set of deployment styles, running Kubernetes on the sort of disparate collection of edge computing hardware has become significantly easier for operators. So it is a huge scale, really, as with anything, one should consider who's going to maintain the system, what are their capabilities, especially as a consultancy. If we're delivering something, we want to be sure that it will have longevity and utility long into its life for a client. Yeah. But also, what are those runtime behaviors that we're actually looking for? Is this something that should scale to zero? In which case, keeping a Kubernetes cluster up the whole time to run it probably makes no sense. That would sit nicely in a cloud run, for example, or or a Lambda-like invocation. Is it something that requires high availability? Well, then maybe we want regional clusters and global routing and and then figure out how we do our data store creation between them. Maybe there's a different caching layer, et cetera. So I, I mean, you're completely right. And one has a Kubernetes, everything looks like a container shaped nail with which to bash it. Oh, well, I was gonna also probably bring another spanner into the works with the whole serverless. You mentioned Lambda as well. There is this whole, I think for people who have been in the space long enough, they kind of saw the movement. There was a whole container first movement then became like a serverless first movement. Now I feel serverless, first has become almost like a back-end thing. It's not really like a front-end thing where Kubernetes seems to be more like 
everyone's back back end front end the whole entire shebang is basically kubernetes do you feel this do you see the same pattern or do you feel because I, i i would have thought based on the definition of cloud native you called out serverless kind of fits that category as well where minimum attack surface comes up and down really quickly very easy to configure just to deploy the applications a do you feel it's still relevant and b uh, maybe I'll, i'll follow up with another one but do you still feel it's relevant yes serverless definitely fits within the sort of broad cloud native paradigm now not officially because k native is a kind of function as a service based app which is in the cncf but the core lambda technology for example is not yeah the issues that we had with lambda v1 were things like latency cold starts were very cold slow start. yeah yeah so we had to do things like constantly ping the endpoint so that it would, would respond in a timely manner when a user turned up lambda v2 then assumed a container like overlay fs file system structure Yep. which looks very suspiciously like they could have just given it an OCI compatible container interface. Then Cloud Run turns up, which does exactly that, fixes the cold start latency times. But still, we have problems when it comes to those Lambda functions of service purely hosted single compute unit entities of introspection. So observability, debugging these things, forensics for a post-mortem if someone breaches them, they're not things that are easy when you have no ability to run a sidecar, no holistic observation of the system because you don't control the infrastructure. Again, Lambda started to address some of these things with security sidecars. They're not called sidecars, but whatever they are. That's where the limit of those systems hits for me. At the point that you have a serious organization looking to do something that's not just an extract, transform load, perhaps or running heavily asynchronous jobs for which those batch system or batch jobs for which those systems are super useful the paradigm gets difficult to apply enterprise level controls to mm. where there's a happy medium something that i quite like is and it's a stack of complexity so i don't recommend it necessarily but again if we run k native function as a service on top of istio on top of kubernetes we can use our native kubernetes observability and security tooling to get full stack visibility of, of everything in the way that we would do traditionally while exposing a function based interface to the developer which gives them whatever they need there that scale to zero the kind of distributed system decomposition into functional units of containers yeah it does also play slightly into the microservices question which is at what point is a microservice too decomposed <laughs> and the answer is, is generally if you're introducing way more network calls than you then you have time to fulfill ultimately yeah yeah there's a thing called too many microservices as well so <laughs> there's a whole another kind of worm for another conversation now since you've kind of i think one last question before we kind of move on to the non technical part of it as well where can people learn more about this as well like obviously they can sign up for the book and get the hacking kubernetes book but is there a wider collection i feel like there's a whole angle of unlearning what people have learned so far if they have been in the it space for a long time like i think i show my age i guess with the beard and everything i'm sure you do as well you've been in the it space for a long time so i'm sure when you walked into the space you had to unlearn a lot of the thinking that you've had or lessons you had learned transitioning from a traditional world to say cloud native and cloud world where do you normally recommend people go and how do they kind of start learning about kubernetes and kubernetes security i often consider how lucky i am to have gone from bare metal through the initial evolution of public cloud into the cloud native renaissance where those initial cloud lessons were learned and new technologies and platforms built as a result now that we find ourselves an infrastructure as code as a thing now we find ourselves in next generation runtimes i do worry about the complexity for new learners in the industry certainly and i speak from a position of survivorship bias <laughs> those mm. but uh, certainly from my perspective everything fundamentally is still silicon to linux and then linux doing various things so yeah fr- from my perspective making sure those fundamentals of why does a file system have users and groups and uh, in discretionary access control everything is a file well actually everything is a stream of bytes but but those fundamental single responsibility per process that those foundational concepts as a philosophical basis upon which to build learning are or have been super useful for me um where would i go to to extend that knowledge i mean i again perhaps I'm showing my age but I love keeping up with with kernel mailing lists lwn.net is a great place just to pick up discussion from kernel maintainers incredibly open and that paraphrases hundreds of thousands of words 
that go into the Linux kernel mailing list. For security philosophy, I think it's difficult to directly sort of instruct, perhaps. But again, from falling back on the book, there's a huge number of references in the book. Some of them, if I can just pull stuff straight off the bookshelf, there's stuff around, here we go. This is one of my favorite books, Threat Modeling, Adam Shostak, Designing for Security. Yeah. This is all about how to decompose our abstract logical views of a system in order to secure the components. And they should be secured in an impact-based order of precedence. So rather than just saying, right, constrictive straight jacket for everything, no one can move. That's very much the old world security mindset. Applying risk-based controls and remediations makes everybody's life easier and ensures yeah. the longevity of the controls themselves. Once we've moved past the kind of the philosophy of how we secure things, the Linux Foundation has a huge amount of awesome free training that helps to build up to the Kubernetes certified administrator and developer and security specialist. They really are a fantastic place to learn. Of course, it's very dear to my heart as well. Control Plane have written a huge amount of training, especially the advanced security training for Kubernetes. We also have a capture the flag simulator. So we run this at all the Linux Foundation events. If you're at KubeCon in Amsterdam, do you come and play? We've got three increasingly nefarious scenarios guide people through the fundamentals of Kubernetes security and then off the deep end. The benefit of those is that while sitting and learning is useful, actually getting hands on keyboards and digging into learning from a practitioner first perspective is the way to cement that knowledge. Yeah, 100% agree. And maybe you should check out the CTF at that KubeCon EU as well. Would they be guided on if people are stuck? You know how sometimes I find myself on CTF, you stuck on level one and you're like just banging your head for hours and you're like, I just wish someone just tell me what to do. I'm just going to move on to that <laughs> challenge. <laughs> would, would they be guided to that sort for people who are going to lose the point, but that's okay? Yes, absolutely. We have not only some of my venerable colleagues wandering around and helping to guide gently in the direction of, of the solution, but also we tear down the whole thing afterwards, run step by step through the compromise, through the rationale, through the various mechanisms and techniques used there's also this wonderful because of the sort of nexus of minds who come and play the game often we find that people have found unusual bypasses that we didn't expect when we built these intentionally vulnerable scenarios so it's always a reciprocal learning experience and yeah we aim to be as discursive and open as possible because so often in security there is this slightly elitist perception of well if you don't understand it then it's on you to go and find out we do this from the opposite extreme. We really want people to, we want to lower the barrier to entry for security as an yeah. industry because we lack the volume of colleagues that we need to secure the world, let's say. And, and also, I'm so infinitely grateful for the amount of open source information that I've been able to ingest over the years. And open source security information has taken a long time to escalate from sort of underground forums, let's say. So we're just looking to help proliferate I think knowledge is power and as much of it. I agree. Awesome. That was the technical question that I had. I've got three more questions to just basically get so that people get to know a bit more about you. First one being, what do you spend most time on when you're not working on cloud native or Kubernetes? Ooh, it's a very good question. My passions are, I love to cycle. I love playing the bass guitar. I have a collection of funky, jazzy and punky tunes in the repertoire that I like to rip through. I, I really enjoy just meandering around London. Oh, nice. I, I do quite a lot of travel, but yeah, London is a rich city of much opportunity. So it, it is reasonably busy running control plane. We have <laughs> colleagues around the world at this point. We've just opened up in New York and then New Zealand as well. So while I'm not talking to friends and colleagues around the world and I find those, those glorious moments of time, yeah, it, it's really about centering and, and remembering to get out into nature and to doing so in the most in the way that raises the heart rate most efficiently. I love how you. Okay, cool. Snowboarding is probably one of them. I guess imagine them. Snowboarding, yeah. I can't ski, but I can snowboard. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> cool. All right. So the next question probably would come around this topic as well. Then, what is something that you're proud of, but is not on your social media? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, my social media tends to be very professional. And I, I don't mean in delivery, but in subject matter. Like, I'm on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Not on Twitter. I was never on Twitter. 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, it's it's really changed on Twitter yeah, uh, in the past yeah. few years, for sure. And LinkedIn is a more verdant source of information in many cases. I would say it's probably, I'm very proud to be to be an uncle to my two new nieces. We didn't have any younger generation in my branch of the family until the last couple of years. So it's been a very kind of late entry in, into life. But yeah, it's a real delight to see the vibrant energy of the of new life in the family. So yeah, that's never made it on social media, but they're, yeah, it, it's very invigorating to see them grow. Well, congratulations to yourself then, I think, and the rest of the family as well. Thank what, you. My third final question, what's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share with us? Ooh, you um, are in London, so I imagine you have a lot of food right next to you. I, I mean, it's, it's the two extremes probably. I adore steak and sushi. But yeah, uh, normally at, at different times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you have them together or like one hand for sushi. <laughs> Although I imagine someone would make a dish. <laughs> yeah, it, it's almost surf and turf, isn't it? But yeah, the uh, I, I mean, the, the, there are so many fantastic Japanese restaurants. Yeah, I, 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 a prime cut of, of sushi, just going in for the for the strange sashimis. Oh, nice. uh, it, it's, it's an absolute passion of mine. And uh yeah, there are some fantastic places around the back of Tottenham Court Road, which is one of my favourite haunts to sneak out to. Mm. And from a steak perspective, I don't think you can beat Hawksmoor, although that's hugely contentious. Mm. There's Hawksmoor, Gaucho or Blacklock w- would be the, the favourites. And all Hawksmoor is reasonably priced and deliciously juicy. I, I also do enjoy a lot of vegan food as well to, to balance, the, balance the three out. Oh. And there's so, so many places to, to eat in London. Yeah. Especially around Soho. So those are my emotional hankers for food. Wow, you just went from steak, sushi to vegan. It's like, you just kind of named every... Well, I guess maybe you should put some... the paleo diet covered, vegan covered. A pescatarian, maybe? Oh, there's flip fish is covered as well. So there you go. But dude... Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I try and eat low carb. So that's the oh, yeah, <laughs> the reason yeah, for the extremity, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And that's, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it as well. I think I try and do the same as well, man. But dude, this was awesome. Where can people find you if they want to have more conversations? Obviously, you're coming to KubeCon EU as well. So they'll definitely see you there and attend the CTF. I want to keep talking about it for the rest of the month as well for April until we get there and maybe after that as well. And hopefully we can have you for the panel conversation on the 19th of April as well at the meet if we just talk about what was your KubeCon experience so far and what you're looking forward to kind of a thing. But where can people find you outside of all that, man? Absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to KubeCon so much. I am uh, up on Twitter. DMs are open. If ever there's a, a tricky, incisive cloud native security question that people want to publicly humiliate me with. So yeah, I, I spend a bit of time there. And again, trying to keep it professional and not too socially blasting then around london i'm always at meetups really love really love the community events i spend a lot of time at things like devops days i've been to quite a few kcds at kcd israel next month sorry next week kcd amsterdam was a couple of weeks ago and then yeah just around the london meetup scene uh so do please interrupt me with whatever i'm doing and say hello i always enjoy having a chat Awesome. I'll definitely put them in the show notes as well. But thank you so much for coming on the show, man. And looking forward to seeing you in person at KubeCon EU, as well as otherwise in person as well in London. 100%. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Really enjoyed it.